Yeah, I can hear you. I can see you You're on a nice, beautiful island there. Oh, yes. Enjoying my <laughs> lockdown on my, uh, my private <laughs> island <laughs> in virtual <laughs> Zoom land. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so um, I believe you've got an offer for us as well. A very generous offer. Yes, yes. What it is, is at the moment, um, I, my game is commercial property. Um, I've been teaching uh, people how to successfully invest in commercial property for a number of years. I've been doing commercial property myself for the last 20 years and property itself for, for 30 years. Um, so I've developed a whole bunch of strategies which really work, which have worked well for me to add real long-term value and the like. The commercial property game has just changed completely uh, in the aftermath of COVID-19. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that's going to change and how people need to pivot their whole commercial property game. What I'm developing is a little, um, uh, is basically an online video course uh, for this. And what I'm inviting for the people that donate, um, I'm going to invite them into the sort of um, the beta focus group for this. So uh, you will get the video course complimentary, but all I ask is for your feedback uh, and how the material was explained, how it worked for you and all the rest of it so that we can kind of feed back into it before releasing the, uh, the final product. So um, my, my, my offer is for the people that donate to this fabulous course, and it's a terrific event that you've done. Um, if you're interested in the ideas that I'm gonna talk about in this hour, and I'll try to share as much as I can in the hour, and you want to join this little focus group, then uh, then then donate, and I'm sure you'll uh, you, you'll pass on those those people. Yeah, absolutely. So what we'll do is for all new donations, um, send me an email again, Joshua at JSM Partners. Um, put um, Ranjan in the subject line, and I'll pass those details over, and you'll be able to get exclusive access um, to this online course that's not even released yet, um, and really you know start absorbing this knowledge and taking action on it. Perfect. Um, so do you have any slides to share? Yes, I do. I'll just uh, load them up and uh, uh, share screen. Uh, we're all getting so used to Zoom nowadays. That's it. Yeah, it's, it's actually really good. <laughs> it's very, very powerful. Very, very powerful indeed. So let me just share my full screen. Okay, oops, that's not the first slide. What am I doing? Should have been a bit more organized in this. Sorry about this. That's it. That's my first slide Perfect. and share. Right, okay. <clears throat> Can you see all that? Yep, that's that's all that's great. Um how much donation? Okay, yeah, we'll address that one. So any size donation, um is that is that fair? Surely it should, it should be at least a this? tenner. You're gonna get a yeah. you're gonna be in this beta group and uh, it should be at least a tenner. Uh the the retail uh, yeah. price for this haven't been decided yet, but um um, yeah, it's I mean, it's going to be a lot more than ten pound. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, a minimum ten pound um, for this one. Um, it is going to be a lot more than this when it's when it's released. You're going to get it before anyone else does, and you're going to get it for a much cheaper price with all of the proceeds going to the NHS. Um, so really, you know, make sure that you are taking advantage of this one, guys. This is a great offer. Perfect. What I'll do now is I'll just uh, mute my mic and stop my video, um, and the screen's all yours. Okay, um, as, I, as I briefly mentioned, I mean, welcome to everybody and thanks for uh, joining us. And it's a great event that uh, has been put together. Um, for people that don't know me, I'll share a little bit about my background, uh, but I'm going to talk about commercial property opportunities. I've been investing in commercial property for quite some time. Uh, I started in 2001 in commercial property, started in property itself in, in the early 1990s. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, today is really why commercial property, why I think it's still very, very special. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what impact uh, COVID-19 crisis has had on commercial property or is going to have in commercial property in my view. And it's going to be a complete game changer. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the opportunities that um, will be abound uh, once the dust has settled from this coronavirus. And you know, if you kind of sort of learn the right stuff, you'll be able to have a little bit of a field day. So I'm gonna try to pack in as, uh, as, 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 much, as I, much as I possibly can um, into, this, uh, into this talk. 
Um, so commercial property is, uh, I, I mean, one of the reasons I got into it was the tenant type. You know, I mean, I have a, I should say I am, I'm a residential property investor. Uh, about 70% of our rent roll comes from residential property and about 30% comes from commercial property. So we have some 300 rooms odd as HMOs and um, single lets and flats and houses. Um, but I'm not really uh, investing in those, uh, I haven't been investing in those or buying those for a good few years now. It's been uh, commercial properties because these sort of tenants are um, generally a lot easier to deal with uh, than your average um, HMO clientele. Um, I started in 1990. Uh, my former career was a, as a management consultant. I did property in parallel to my management consulting career. And uh, in 2001, I jacked it all into, uh, basically I was financially free by 2001, so I just decided to do property full time and do investing and developing, uh, mainly in um, high value areas of North London. Um, I've been through a couple of recessions, and uh, one thing I know, I mean, I, this COVID-19 crisis, and I wanna make this quite clear during this talk, uh, I never wished for this to happen. Uh, it is something that's happening and it's a terrible thing that's happening. What we're going to start to see in the coming months is the economic effect of this lockdown and this grinding to a halt of the, uh, of, of the UK economy and the world economy. And that's going to have an effect and that is going to cause a recession. And the thing is, um, if you know what you're doing in property, huge profits are made in recessionary times. Uh, it's not something we wished for or wanted, but it's happening. So you might as well adjust uh, and, and, and get in ahead of the curve so that you can kind of uh, make the best out of those opportunities that will, will come. Um, so during the last, um, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, strategies I'm gonna talk about today is really based on what I found work um, I mean, in the, in the recessions in the 1990s, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was very new to this. And then after the Lehman's crash in 2009, when we had the credit crunch, I felt I knew a little bit more about what I was doing. And I, uh, I sort of did more of what went right in the, in the 1990s and did less of uh, what didn't work out. And uh, that really worked well. So um, what I'm going to talk about is stuff that really... Um, is, is, is if you have been through and, and successfully invested in previous recessions, you simply have um, uh, proven knowledge, if you like, of what tends to work um, when the market pivots. The people who will be caught short will be the people who don't change. Um, whatever investment strategies you were looking at a couple of months ago, uh, you need to have a serious look at whether they're still worth pursuing after lockdown, because many of them simply will not be worth it. You will not, yeah, it'll be completely flogging a dead horse. Um, so what I'm gonna share with you is really how we are pivoting our commercial property game um, for the post uh, COVID-19 environment uh, as we come into what will be a recession. So um, we, uh, I, my model has been pretty much what we build uh, we build a lot of flats, we convert a lot of old buildings into flats, we convert a lot of commercial buildings into residential usage, and we also convert commercial buildings into other commercial units, but we tend to keep um, what we make. Uh, we also have a serviced office business, we've got a new serviced office centre in St Albans, uh, co-working space and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I do a lot of uh, speaking at events and uh, I'm a judge on the uh, Property Investor Awards and um, these are my contact details. I'll show you these later on as well, but you can reach out to me on the usual platforms. Um, I run the Baker Street Property Meet as well. It's uh, before lockdown, it was the UK's largest property networking event. We used to get 300 people come to our uh, monthly meets. Um, we've gone online now. Our last online meet, we had more than a thousand people on our uh, online meet and it's very interactive and uh, it, uh, it's, 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 it's quite an Quite, a, quite an interesting meet. The next one of these is free. Uh, while we're online, we're, we're, we're doing these as free meets. The next one is this Wednesday. Uh, we've got Shaf Rizal, uh, Simon Zushi, Mark Alexander, myself. We're talking about post-COVID-19 opportunities for property investors. Uh, and they, that, they, we have already got more than a thousand people registered for that. So that's going to be a, um, a very, very interesting event for this Wednesday. So. Uh, just sign up for free at bakerstreetpropertymeet.com. 
Um, I'm on YouTube too, um, uh, around about 15,000 subscribers. A lot of what I'm going to talk about, uh, if you go onto my YouTube channel, you'll see full-blown videos um, going through the concepts and uh, ex explaining these sort of things to you. So just subscribe on there. We push out new stuff every week. Um, and it's all to, you know, help you up your property game. Um, okay, so let's just start by talking a little bit about why um, you should buy commercial property. I'm going to talk about some of the advantages. I'm going to talk about um, my two core principles for investing in commercial real estate. And this is what I've taught to my mentees and students for years. And the people who have adopted these policies my two core principles have found that their portfolios have gone into COVID-19 very, very strong indeed, because commercial property is being affected disproportionately more so than the residential uh, property sector. But if you bought the right stuff, you're affected far less and you're going to be very, very solid coming out of this. And I'll explain what those strategies are and uh, why those are, those are so important. And I'll also share some strategies that you should think about for um, uh, uh, what sort of properties to acquire uh, once we get out of this lockdown and into this recessionary environment and what sort of assets are the best ones to buy during a recessionary climate. So it's quite a lot to talk about. Um, why commercial property? Um, I just wanted to share with you uh, some sort of basics really before I get into the COVID-19 stuff and the post-COVID-19 opportunities. Um, now, the commercial property, um, we have residential property and uh, you're responsible for everything. Um, all the maintenance, anything that goes wrong. Uh, with commercial property, you have something called a full repairing insuring lease, which means the tenant is um, liable for uh, internal and external repairs. In February this year, we had great storms, if you remember. We had some uh, uh, lots of wind and rain and uh, uh, and if you had a sizable residential portfolio, there was a weekend where in February where there was a ton of storms and, you know, turned up on Monday and in the office, there were calls and emails flying in, um, fences broken down, uh, gutter has uh, uh, broken off, TV aerial, one guy rang up in an HMO saying the TV aerial had fallen off and can he have compensation for his TV license or something like that. Um, so we get this email as well in the office, Monday morning after the storm. This is the picture of a sign um, uh, above a shop uh, which had just fallen off onto the pavement. And the email read like this, I'm not sure who to contact. However, the office front has been damaged by the storm. Please see pictures attached and please let me know what you We'll be doing about it regarding the damage and when someone will be coming out. Now, when, when you receive these sort of emails, you know, you almost feel that finger of blame pointing out of you at the screen. What are you going to be doing about it? And with residential property, of course, the owner is, is on you to actually do something about it. Uh, but our response was this. Sorry to hear about the storm damage. Please note that you have a commercial FRI full repairing and insuring lease. And as such, this repair is a matter for you to sort out. So that is basically the A to Z of uh, property um, repairs and maintenance, if you like, with, uh, with, with commercial units. I mean, I'm being a bit flippant. There's a little bit more to it than that. But what I'm trying to say is that um, what I discovered with residential property is that it's not scalable. It's very hard to scale a residential property business because it needs a lot of boots on the ground to manage those properties. Um, and whether, they're, whether you decide to do it in-house and employ your own staff or have a management agent to do that for you, um, you're still ultimately responsible for those, uh, for those properties and checking that your management team is doing what they say they're going to do. Um, so in our business, we have, as I said in the beginning, 70% of our rent roll is residential, 30% is commercial. Um, to manage that 70% of residential rent roll, I have four four staff, about four and a half really, if I include part-time. Uh, to manage the commercial real estate, that's 30% of the portfolio. I pretty much do myself and it takes me two or three hours a week max. Um, so what I find with commercial property is many people get into property for financial freedom, um, but with residential property, there's a limit to how much you can scale it before you don't have time freedom and you certainly have difficulty with location freedom. Uh, for me, 
uh, property is about uh, having having financial time and location freedom and commercial property uh, sort of best delivers on that dream. Um, the other thing I found is that in the early 1990s when I was actually buying properties in a recession um, a lot of the people I was buying property back then I was buying residential properties but a lot of the people I was buying from were tired landlords and people still talk about this strategy today, target tired landlords. Um, they will give you a great deal, they wanna get out. Um, and then I bought a few portfolios and things from various tired landlords, you know, 65, 70 plus age group. And then it, the, the thought dawned on me, um, one day that tired landlord is gonna be me. What makes me think, I met a, a lot of very, very clever folks who are tired landlords in the residential game um, what makes me think that I won't be tired when I'm their age? Um, and then I started meeting commercial property landlords and I'd meet 80 year old guys and they'd have, they'd own some McDonald's drive through somewhere and it generates a hundred thousand pound a year rent and it's let out for 20 years, full repairing, insuring lease, and they get four rent payments every year. They're not tired. They, you know, they're, they're, they're living their life. Um, so that got me thinking about this whole um, uh, time freedom, location freedom, financial freedom thing, and whether residential property is a great way to get started, but whether that actually delivers on the end game going forward is, is another thing altogether. Um, so <clears throat> why commercial property? As I mentioned, um, the leases are great. Uh, instead of ASTs, which are six to 12 months, you typically get five to 10 year leases on a, and the, the leases, the properties are let out on a full repairing and insuring basis, which means the tenant is responsible for um, repairs. The other thing it's great for is cash flow, because uh, rents are paid quarterly in advance, which is very, very powerful and gives you very, very robust cash flow in your business. Um, there's much less regulation uh, than uh, buy to let, uh, residential buy to let in the last 10 years, uh, the regulation has been getting tougher and tougher um, and more stringent uh, with HMO licensing coming all over the place and um, you know, there may be rent controls around the corner, who knows what's happening in, in residential buy to let. But here's the thing, um, when I started in residential property, it was the last few years of the Margaret Thatcher era and uh, Margaret Thatcher wanted to transform the UK into a home-owning democracy. She wanted to encourage people to own their own home. And therefore, all government policies were steered around residential home ownership, whether that was as an owner-occupier or it was a landlord. Um, in the years that have gone sort of beyond Margaret Thatcher, in, uh, the, as more voters have become renters, the direction of government policy has been to support renting as opposed to home ownership, uh, which is why the tide is basically uh, not on our side as a residential um, buy-to-let landlord. The thing with commercial property uh, uh, though is that most of my commercial properties are let out under a lease um, which, were, which came up, which was, which was brought in in 1954 and very little has changed since then because commercial rents are business contracts. Um, and it's, it's just a different ball game in terms of uh, uh, regulation. It's not like anything like the, uh, the residential space. The other thing that I like, I mean, I particularly like um, high value areas um, because they, they, they basically attract better tenants and, uh, and, and you get more stronger capital growth over time. The trouble with high value areas uh, for residential property is the 3% uh, SDLT surcharge, which does affect the viability of a lot of those properties and which makes a lot of people think, well, why don't I go up north because the stamp duty is less. Um, but with commercial property, commercial property is, is, uh, attracts a completely different SDLT charge um, and it is far less than residential property with the 3% surcharge. And here's the thing, mixed use property so say a shop with a couple of flats above, uh, if it's mixed use, meaning some of the use is commercial, then the whole of the property uh, stamp duty will be at the commercial property rates. Uh, and that can be very advantageous. Just to give you a quick example, if you were to buy a 500,000 property, 500,000 pounds property under residential SDLT, 
you would pay £30,000 in stamp duty. If you were to buy a £500,000 commercial property or mixed use property, the stamp duty would be only 14 and a half. So it's less than half. Uh, so stamp duty is, a, is, is, is an interesting um, angle, particularly for investing and developing in high value areas. Um, I mentioned this before. Um, if you're into res if you're already in residential property, I think it's a it's, it's certainly a good move to divest uh, your eggs, uh, some of your eggs out of the residential uh, basket. And uh, the big driver for me was that the commercial property. I meet commercial property l uh, landlords who are very elderly, uh, but they're not tired at all. Uh, it really does deliver on that financial freedom dream. Um, so. My two core principles for investing in commercial real estate. Now, you will read in the media about how badly affected commercial real estate has been um, with this COVID-19 crisis, and that, that is true. Um, but I've been um, uh, always a bit wary about commercial real estate um, because the trouble with commercial real estate is that it's not like it's at home. Uh, no one, the only need people have to occupy commercial space is because they have a business there. That's it. Um, now, if that business fails or if no other business wants to uh, occupy those premises, you must have a plan B. So I only, what I teach people is to only invest in commercial real estate, which follows these two principles. So. Um, because commercial values are ultimately driven by uh, occupier demand. There has to be occupier demand um, to support the level of rental income that's being paid, not just by the current occupiers of the property, but in the open market. Now, what do I mean by that? There were a lot of properties, for example, in the 1990s, uh, it was very common for big companies to do something called sale and lease back. So what they would do is they owned uh, some of the betting shop chains did this and some of the um, many of the chains did this actually pub groups and all sorts but um, so so what they would they owned their real estate as a company and what they did then is is they uh, basically sold the freehold and leased that property back into the trading business but the lease was normally set at a at a, at a higher rent than um, was market rent so as to make the freehold more attractive for an investor to purchase. So one of the things with commercial real estate is that if there's, an, if there's already a tenant there, you've got to be absolutely sure um, that the rent they're paying is market rent. It's not over rented. Um, you've, got to, you've got to be comfortable that if, they, if their business were to fail, there is another tenant uh, who would be willing to rent that real estate and um, do their business there and pay the same amount of rent. Um, and the most important thing is to have a plan B, C or D for the property. Now in recent years, uh, in many commercial asset classes, there's actually open oversupply. We have an oversupply of shops. We also have an oversupply of offices. And for that reason, the government have, have given us permitted development rights and this has been a game changer because developing properties with planning permission is a pain in the bum. If you do it with under permitted development, uh, permitted development are rights that central government have given us um, to easily uh, redevelop uh, commercial properties, uh, convert some of the space or all of the space into residential use without having to go through a convoluted planning process. So what I always look for in commercial real estate is okay, that's great, that's a nice shop, that's a nice office. Yes, I've got a tenant today, but if they are to move out, um, I want to be able to uh, redevelop that property using permitted development rights um, so that I would be in a better position if they left than if they stayed. Um, and there are plenty of those opportunities around. Um, and I'll talk. I'll show you with you a few examples of that and what I mean by that um, uh, in in a moment. But if you've generally followed those two principles um, in your commercial real estate investing strategy, you will uh, do well. You'll have a rock solid portfolio uh, going forward, um, and you'll you'll certainly come out of this COVID nineteen crisis um, with something quite solid. Okay, how has COVID nineteen affected the commercial real estate game. Um, well, 
the, the first thing that people may be aware of is that the government have put in place um, some uh, where's my slide? Okay, the government, the, the government, what the government have done is that uh, normally with commercial property, um, the laws are so much in the landlord's favour. If a tenant doesn't pay rent, if a commercial payment tenant doesn't pay rent, um, you have the power to basically send in bailiffs without going to court. Um, they can take goods from the premises up to the value of your rent. Uh, you can even forfeit the lease if they don't, haven't paid within 21 days. So the landlord has huge amount of power. And that's necessary because many times um, it's a David and Goliath relationship um, between landlord and tenant. I mean, I'm a very small guy compared to Starbucks. You know, if I've got Starbucks as a tenant, uh, they've got uh, much more um, power and leverage than little old me. But the fact that you've got these rules that are so much in your favor allows you to actually collect your rent. I mean, we had an issue, uh, I love telling this story, we had an issue, we picked up an HSBC uh, bank branch um, a, about, a, about a year and a half uh, ago. And the first quarter's rent, they did not pay. They claimed that it was an admin error and they hadn't set us up on their system and all this sort of stuff. And they, they said they'd outsourced their rent payable to Warsaw and they were um, all sorts of excuses. So we invoked the CRA process, which is the commercial rent arrears recovery process. And um, by the invoking that process, you send a seven day, you send a notice saying that you want payment. Otherwise, seven days you send in a bailiff. So then after seven days, a bailiff turned up to HSBC Canary Wharf HQ um, with a order to, to kind of remove goods and we were paid within a couple of hours. Um, that's one of the reasons why commercial property can be so powerful if you buy the right stuff in the right areas. What the government have done with COVID-19 is they've actually um, suspended uh, landlords right to use CRA um, and they've suspended the right to uh, forfeit the lease due to non-payment of rent for three months. So what's happened, what's happened now is that some people or some of the, particularly the bigger chains and things have taken this on themselves to say, right, okay, this is an excuse to, to save the cash flow um, and not pay some landlords um, their rent. Uh, and this is causing a lot of problems with some landlords and it, it and coming out of this this is going to create opportunities for people to, to play a, a very very savvy game now um, we uh, the there was a survey done by Knight Frank and they said that um, the lot at the last quarter's commercial rent collection day some 20% of uh, rents were actually paid by quarterly tenants now our in our own portfolio, we've actually collected 67% of um, uh, our uh, commercial rent roll. Why is that? Because what we've found is that smaller companies have paid up. It's the larger companies that are playing the game. What I've always taught people um, is that actually larger companies are great. You know, the Greggs and the Costas and the Starbucks and all these big guys, you know, they, yeah, they're, they're nice. But what I find is that um, if there's a game to be played, uh, they have big teams of people and they'll play those games and they can run rings around you. Uh, the smaller guys, it's less so. The great thing, a lot of our portfolio is actually rented out to smaller tenants. And the thing with smaller tenants, what we always do is so it might be a, a family company, they have two or three retail stores or what have you. But with those sort of people as tenants, you lease directly to the proprietor and you also get a personal guarantee from them. And those person, and they are, they are also UK homeowners. So that gives you a very, very strong rental covenant. So they know that it's not as though um, they're being let off the rent for three months. They know it's just a deferment for three months. Uh, so they know they've got to pay up. Um, and rather than let costs build up and all the rest of it, they, have, they, they by and large, the smaller companies have, uh, have, have, have settled their, uh, the bills. The other side of this is that during this COVID-19 crisis, the government has helped the tenants rather than the landlords. So every um, retail occupier, if they pay business rates, 
they're getting upwards of £20,000 as a grant. Um, so we've got a tenant who rents a couple of Costa stores from us, and uh, he's got a chain of uh, something like 30 of these uh, Costa franchise stores, but we rent two stores to him. And um, they, they receive a, a um, grant, a COVID-19 grant of £20,000 for each store that they have, up to a maximum of £800,000 per company. Um, plus they've furloughed all their staff and all the rest of it. So a lot of these guys, they have actually got the, um, uh, the money to pay. Um, what, what I suspect they're doing is they're just keeping hold of it because there's a three month moratorium and then they'll pay it if you make a fuss at the end of the three months. Um, so that's what we've found with that. Um, one thing I will say is what's uh, coming at the, at the end of this and uh, what we need to kind of think of as well. Um, we, we, we're gonna, we're gonna see a depre we are going to see a recession. Uh, and just to put this into perspective, in 2008, 2009, there was a 6% drop in GDP. In the early 1990s, it was um, uh, 2 to 3%. In the 1930s, people talked about it, it, there was actually an 8% drop in GDP. Um, most of the experts are predicting a 10% uh, drop in GDP for the second quarter of 2020. Now, the big question is, how long is it going to take or how little time will it be before it all bounces back? Now, when we have a recession, uh, I believe it's going to bounce back, but there will be a little bit of musical chairs going on. Uh, um, the whole economy has been shut down, the music has stopped, and if you haven't got your bum on your seat, a lot of businesses will be in trouble. When the music starts again, um, there'll be some people that will fall by the wayside and there'll be other people that will be able to pick up some, some opportunities that will, that will arise. Um, what, what will happen though is that uh, residential property, and this, what, this is what happens in every single recession, residential property picks up faster than commercial property. Um, the pickup of residential property will see a dip. Um, uh, basically because of falling demand um, and it will recover and that recovery will be, will be dependent on how quickly the job market recovers. Um, we've seen people furloughed, we've also seen people laid off. So there will be a lot of people who will be, and it will take time before businesses come back out of lockdown and get firing on full thrusters again. Um, so it'll, it'll take time before they they, those, those companies that come back out of lockdown start to employ people again and uh, pick up some of that slack. Now, if it takes three months, that's great. If it takes six months, that's not so great. Um, but it will sort of bounce back. So what we, and, and what you always see as well is that when there's a massive event where there's a, people change jobs, what that also means is there'll be a lot of people in new jobs. Um, so if you've been furloughed or if you've been uh, laid off or whatever, when we come out of lockdown, they'll get a new job. So they will be in a brand new job. So the, chan the, the thing is that people who are in brand new jobs, they're on a probationary period and all of that, a lot of those sort of folks are far more likely to rent than risk or take the move um, to buy a place, um, if you like. Uh, so you tend to find that the buying market is a little bit depressed until the job market recovers, but the rental market is very, very strong. Commercial property values um, will uh, present a great opportunity because there will be landlords who aren't, don't have enough cash flow reserves to take not getting rent for a couple of quarters. There'll be, there'll be um, uh, commercial uh, business owners who will decide not to come back out of lockdown um, now, I know with one of our um, premises, um, it's led to a couple, they're in their 60s. Um, it's highly unlikely that they're going to, they'll just decide to take early retirement after lockdown. And there are a lot of people who, who, who are in that sort, of, uh, that, sort of, that sort of position. So what we're going to see is a massive amount of stock, a massive, uh, more commercial properties coming onto the market than ever before. Now, what that means is that more properties coming onto the market than ever before, we'll see then a little bit of a depression in commercial property values. What we have this time, uh, which is quite different to any other recession, is we have more permitted development rights than we've ever had before, which allow us to easily take commercial properties 
and convert all or some of the square footage of floor space into residential use. When we come out of lockdown, there's going to be some sort of recovery emergency budget and expect to see um, planning reforms, some more PD rights being introduced uh, to allow commercial buildings to convert to residential use, perhaps some stamp duty holidays. In 2009, in the last um, crash, um, what they did is they raised the SDLT thresholds for commercial properties uh, for a few years. So many of the commercial properties we bought between 2009 and 2013, we didn't pay any stamp duty on before. It was a temporary measure to encourage investment in that sector. So the opportunity that is about to unfold is where commercial property values will be depressed. There will be more stock. There will be more um, commercial properties being uh, on the market than ever before, M many more so than there are buyers available. But you have rights under permitted development to easily convert some of those properties, and I say some, 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 many commercial properties won't be worth saving, but there are plenty which will, um, where you can easily implement permitted development rights to convert some or all of the space to residential use. Now, why does that matter? Because what you do is by magic, you take a commercial property, which is on a depressed track, and by implementing a permitted development uh, right, you convert it to residential use, which will be on a faster track to recovery. Residential values will not depress as much as commercial values, uh, and they will recover far faster as soon as uh, in, in line with how the job market normalizes. So um, what we have is a magical opportunity to take commercial real estate, which will be plentiful, uh, apply PD to it, convert it to residential usage, and put it on a completely different track uh, to recovery. And there, therein really lies the opportunity. Um, the other thing that I worries the hell out of me uh, and worried the hell out of me in 2009 was quantitative easing. Uh, they call it quantitative easing, but I call it crack economics. If you print money, um, I mean, how do you pay for this coronavirus um, crisis? They could either tax us, but what they've chosen to do is just print a lot more money and basically make the value of whatever we have worth less through uh, money printing. So what's my solution to this? Well, my solution to this in 2009 was to invest in stuff they can't print. Um, and what you've got also got to remember is that if you have a pound, that pound will be worth less in real terms in a few years' time as a result of all the, pro all the money they've printed. Um, so how do you keep the value of that pound in your pocket um, so that it doesn't get inflated away? Well, the way I do it, or the way I did it in 2009, was I bought property in good solid areas. I added value very, very quickly. The market was flat, but I added value through implementing development and permitted development rights to quickly build value into that asset that you've got, and then refinance it, and then basically pull out a lot of your money. So what you have done is even though the value of your money is being inflated away, by putting it in something uh, where you can develop value in that vehicle, you more than hedge against um, uh, the cash that would otherwise be inflated away. Um, so whatever, whatever people do, um, if you've got some money, you've got to have some way of hedging against uh, sort of the inflation that's going to happen with all this quantitative easing that's gone on. And the surefire way of doing that is to put that money in something that's finite. Yeah, you can do gold and a whole bunch of all of the other stuff. But if you do property, the great thing is it's income producing, uh, whereas a lot of other asset classes aren't. Um, so where was I then? Once uh, lockdown is over now, okay. So, so the opportunity then, once the lockdown is over, um, we're going to see business failures. We're going to see shops closing. We're going to see landlords with poor, poor cash flow. We're going to see more permitted development opportunities than we've ever seen before because part of this recovery budget that, that will be announced soon uh, will be about uh, because to get yourself out of a recession um, one of the surefire ways for government uh, to focus on is to get people developing and get property market moving because property 
transactions are high value and it's a good bet to get the whole economy moving by encouraging people to do things with real estate whether it's to develop them or whatever because it has effects in the job market uh, when people develop it has effects in the supply chain uh, it has wider effects for the whole employ in employment market so expect to see um, uh, emergency measures that allow us to do a lot more with properties once we're we're out of this it's happened in every uh, it's happened in 2009 I expect it to happen now and um, the other thing that uh, gets really great fun is the ability to play creative financing structures and vendor financing structures and this is something I talk a lot about now when the market is flat and there aren't too many buyers for a particular type of assets then the seller is much more open um, uh, to all sorts really now uh, what what we try to do is structure is is structure things as creatively as possible so for example if you're buying a property from a vendor and you're looking at implemented a permitted development right um, well you can secure you can agree a price with the vendor you can um, uh, let's say you're going to buy that property for a hundred thousand pound you can agree that price uh, today you can secure that property on an option agreement uh, you can then apply for the permitted development to do whatever redevelopment you're doing once you've got that piece of paper that uh, that says yes it's all um, approved uh, you can then get financing to exercise your option to buy that property but you will get your financing based on an uplifted value because you've created value by getting um, a piece of paper to say that you're allowed to implement your permitted development rights if that makes sense so the long and short of it is there you need money to buy property um, the bank will give you so much 60 70 percent and you need the rest where do you get the rest from you don't necessarily have to put that in yourself in a flat market you can get the vendor um, to help you with that by uh, possibly even coming in as a JV partner, um, having a delayed completion, which allows you to get the planning uplift sorted and then get the fi end financing based on the um, uh, uplifted value. Uh, you can play a lot of games, lease options, uh, all these, uh, a lot of techniques like lease options were founded in the commercial property space. They started off there and they were established there and people tried to kind of adapt them to residential property. Um, but their home is in commercial property and these strategies work a lot better um, in a uh, more depressed market. Uh, so what I find is that in a, in a heated market, it's very, very difficult. Um, a couple of years ago, commercial property was very, very popular. Uh, it was very, very difficult to get creative financing or deal structuring to work because if you suggested a complicated offer to a vendor there was some other guy that was had cash in, the, in their pocket who would just say I'll buy unconditionally in a more depressed market um, there aren't a ton of buyers so whatever offer you've got the vendor will listen and that is a time when people who don't necessarily have the funds can be very clever by equipping themselves with the knowledge of how to structure these deals so that they can pitch the vendor an offer that works for both parties uh, and this sort of thing works a treat even if you've got money when I went into the 2009 uh, recession I had funds uh, but I still use these techniques because what if I just used my own funds I could only do one deal at a time but there's only a finite window in a recession to capitalize on it uh, in in the last one it was 2009 to 2013 was the time to make hay when the sun shined and I think we'll have a similar sort of two, three, four year maximum period. So if you're limiting yourself to doing deals that had to have a long horizon, uh, might take a year to do or, uh, or require a ton of your money to be tied up in it, there's only gonna be so much you can do in that window of opportunity. Um, so let me just share with you some um, quick examples of uh, stuff that uh, you can do and some of these PD rights that are easily implementable. Um, so <clears throat> under permitted development, what you, one, one thing you can do is you can take a shop um, under usage class A1 and A2, but you can take a shop and convert to the rear of that shop into a flat. 
Uh, and you can do that under permitted development, which means you don't have to go through a long convoluted planning process. Um, so uh, in this particular example, um, you take a you take the, the shop, which is which is relatively narrow, but long and deep. Um, you make the front part of it into a shop and you make the rear part into a flat. Now, the reason why this is so magical and you can do this under permitted development. Uh, the reason why this is um, so magical is that um, commercial shops rent on a sort of um, the rent is determined per square foot and the rent varies depending on 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 on, on where in the shop um, you are so typically the first third of the shop is what they call zone a and the rent the rent per square foot on the first third of a shop as you sort of go into it is the highest the second third of the shop is zone b and the third, the rear is zone C, and the rents fall off by half. So if the front of the shop, zone A, the rent is 60 pound a square foot, zone B will be 30 pound a square foot, and the back zone C will be 15 pound a square foot. And this is because um, normally retail customers will come to the front of the shop, that will be where you'll get the most trading profit and the rear is normally for storage and, uh, and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so the, the rental value in a shop is really for the square footage at the front. When you can convert the rear of a shop into a flat, what you do is you pretty much take commercial real estate, which is zone B and zone C, which achieves very low rent per square foot and you convert it into residential. Now in most areas, residential rents per square foot are roughly equivalent to zone A uh, commercial rents. So what you do by magic is you turn uh, this entire shop, you turn every square foot of that floor space into the equivalent of zone A, and that works a treat. I've got a video on YouTube um, you may want to watch. This is one of my students who uh, bought a shop like this in Ealing last year from auction, converted it into a um, the rear into a flat. Um, this uh, the, the the flat has be has found a buyer. I think the uh, shop has found a buyer yesterday as well. Uh, and that's uh, and she's coming out with two hundred thousand pound profit from this sort of deal. And she did it no money down. You can see it all on YouTube. It explains uh, how it's done. But these sort of shops are up and down the land. It's just about finding. Uh, the opportunity, knowing how to exploit the opportunity uh, to come up with these sort of gains. And as I said, um, more commercial premises are going to come onto the market over the next few months. Not all of them um, will be worth you buying. Most of them won't. Most of them will not have alternative uses that are easily realizable through permitted development. Um, so most of them you won't be able to save, uh, but there are many that will. For example, the betting industry is is undergoing massive change right now uh, with the death of these fixed uh, odd betting terminal thingies. Um, the the betting shops are not profitable. They were making money from these crack machines, they call them, um, which allowed people to just gamble in these little machines. Uh, because of government restrictions on the, on the maximum stake that people can gamble away, more than half of betting shops are now unprofitable. So as we come out, or as they end their leases, many of the betting chains are handing these, these properties back to the landlords. Now, betting shops are eligible for this sort of permitted development right. Um, uh, so there's so many of these sort of buildings coming on, on, on the market over the next few months. Um, it, it's really gonna be sort of uh, shooting fish in a barrel type of thing. Um, this is a property one of my uh, students picked up. He, he kind of bought a whole bunch of, uh, he started off in residential, has about um, quite a fairly, fairly sized residential portfolio. This was his first commercial asset. Um, and, this was, and this basically follows my two principles. Um, it's, it's actually in a business park. Um, but it's a, it's one of the, you may have noticed a lot of these business parks have become almost retail parks. You'll see a screw fix in there and a builder's depot and stuff like that. So this is a, actually a trampolining center, a kids trampolining center. Um, and, uh, 
uh, it's rented directly to the mom and pop um, uh, operator who kind of run that little business. Um, so they're a UK homeowner, it's absolutely great. The other thing uh, that Darren made sure of is whether there is an alternative tenant who would occupy the business, or occupy those pre premises if this trampolining center failed. Now in this, in this um, little business park, there's a tool station. Um, and one of the things I teach is how to find occupiers for properties and, and different people, whether it's a coffee shop chain or a retail chain or a restaurant chain, uh, they all look for different things and they all have their criteria. Now, one of the things I know that, um, is that tool station have a very simple strategy. Um, if screw fix are there, they want to be next door. And tool station have a simple strategy as well. If screw fix are there, they want to be there. So this place has a tool station, uh, more or less next door. Um, so we approached Screwfix before um, the auction to find out whether they, were, they would be provisionally interested. And they said they'd love to have a crack at that site. So immediately uh, managed to kind of de-risk it by saying, well, okay, the existing tenant is great. They're a UK homeowner, it's a good solid business. Is there an alternative commercial occupier? Yes. Does it have alternative uses um, a massive redevelopment potential. Trampolining centers, as you can imagine, require a lot of head height. So the ceiling heights are massive, plenty of potential to internally put in other floors. Um, there are buildings in there that have been in this uh, business park that have been converted to offices. There are other commercial uses for this thing. So you've got to de-risk the uh, investment as far as possible by looking at what the alternative uses are. But the biggest thing Darren said to me uh, when he picked up this thing was, uh, I get 55,000 pounds a year rent from this tenant and they pay me four times a year quarterly in advance. And he said to me, um, it's, it's just hit me, Ranjan, how much work I have to do to generate 55,000 pounds worth of rent roll from renting out rooms compared to 55,000 pounds a year from this commercial premises with four payments a year. Um, and that was his kind of, uh, I mean, he realized the theory, but when he bought his first one, it was kind of all, all, all hit home really uh, of um, uh, what a better asset class it is if you do it right. Um, uh, another one of my guys, Nilesh, uh, picked up this property. It doesn't look very much, um, but uh, fantastic uh, yield on this. Uh, the tenants are great. Uh, but the thing with this is it's got PD rights and, and development potential. And if the tenants are to move out, he is in a better position if the tenants moved out than if they stay. Uh, because he can develop four flats above this building. It's in a reasonable prosperous area. Um, and these are the sort of properties I love. It's great if the tenants are in there. They produce a great yield while they're there. But if they move out, you've got um, development potential. Going back to the COVID-19 crisis, I mentioned um, that some of our tenants haven't paid. Um, once the moratorium on rent collection is over, um, we're basically going to ask all our tenants for the rent. Um, and, because, and, and we can do that because if they um, don't pay, we'll take back the property because all of them have alternative uses. All of them have alternative uses which would put us in a better position and they're easily realizable because we can achieve those alternative uses through permitted development. Um, so what some of the big guys are doing, like we got a letter from one of the betting shop chains saying, um, and, and you could see it's a standard letter that they're sending to all their landlords saying, uh, COVID-19 crisis, the betting industry has changed. Can we have a rent-free period they've asked for? Um, we've said no. Uh, well, they've sent it to every single uh, landlord they've got. Um, but the thing is, it all depends on the landlord's position. The landlord is in a weak position if they have a site which has no alternative uses. Uh, and there are many sites like that. If the landlord has no alternative than to rent to that betting shop because there's no one else interested and there's nothing else they can do with the property, they're stuffed. If you have an alternative use, then they're stuffed. Um, uh, uh, just um, uh, last year, uh, against one of the uh, betting um, chains, um, 
uh, coral actually, uh, we successfully uh, won a rent review where we actually got a rent increase out of coral. And we are the only landlord in the country to have got a rent increase um, out of coral um, in, in 2019. Now, because coral have pleaded poverty, they've said that, um, hey, um, we can't do this and, and they're, they're, they're saying it doesn't matter about the rent review, we're not giving any rent increases. So we took them through the sort of tribunal process and won. The reason why we had the confidence to do that is because if they don't want the shop, then it has, that, that we only bought that site because it had alternative uses. So if you don't want to pay the market rent, then fine, go. We've got alternative uses for that site, which, which put us in a better position. And by having that as your guiding principle to all the commercial investments that you make, you have a rock solid portfolio that will withstand anything. Um, and that's basically been the essence of the strategy that I've, uh, I, I've kind of advocated to people. Um, I haven't got too much time. I'll just talk a little bit about um, PD again. Um, the thing with PD is there's, there are so many different PD rights and it's knowing how to exploit them. And people don't fully understand which PD rights they can apply to which site. Because it is complicated, it doesn't, it doesn't need a bit of knowledge. So this is a, um, a double fronted building in Stoke Newington High Street. Now P, well, there's one PD right that allows you to build two flats above a retail unit under perm permitted development without planning. So under this, above this building, we could potentially build four flats under that PD. But there's another PD right, which allows you to convert office space into flats. And there is no restriction on the number of flats you can create. Now this building was, used to be an HSBC bank branch. And it was an HSBC bank branch as at 2013. And the PD says that if, so the upper floors were basically offices for the, for the bank. And because that space, the upper space was used as offices, um, we could apply a different PD right to that site, which allows us to convert that space into as many flats as we like. Now, because this is Stoke Newington, micro flats kind of work. So what we're doing with this one is this is gonna be eight, eight uh, micro apartment, uh, studio apartments for long-term let. Um, so by knowing what, and no one, and, and really, um, if you know which PD right or how, with commercial property, this is what I normally say to people, with residential property, you've got a three bedroom end of terrace, everyone knows the potential. Um, we've all seen Sarah Beanie, Homes Under the Hammer and all of that. With commercial property, it's not entirely obvious. You can look at a building, you can look at some of these buildings, you know, uh, what is the potential? You know, you can't exactly tell. It's not exactly obvious. It's all in the knowledge. And um, if you've got a better plan, a more profitable plan from the next guy, then you can afford to pay more for that property for that guy than the next guy. You can win the deal uh, because your plan for what you're going to do with it is better. And that knowledge is certainly not universal. Um, I don't think I've got too much time. Um, the other thing that we do is serviced offices. Uh, I mean, we bought, we've bought a few buildings to convert to, um, office buildings to convert to um, residential use. But so many people have done office to resi conversions that actually sometimes it makes sense to um, keep them as offices. And what we've done is uh, set up a serviced office brand, Fab Office, uh, where we're doing co-working and business centers and smaller suites and all of that. And particularly coming out of COVID-19, um, there are gonna be relatively few people that will want to enter into a new lease for an office for five or 10 years. And we're seeing a lot of inquiries from even larger companies who prefer the flexibility uh, that a serviced office uh, uh, provides. Um, I'm a big fan of Warren Buffett. Um, be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. I always like to kind of, I think if I characterize my years in the property business, I've done the best by doing the opposite of what the media has told me to do at any one point in time. People thought I was nuts to buy residential property in the early 1990s. I bought it, it was cash flow positive, it worked out great. No one was buying commercial property in 2009, uh, but I was buying them, I was finding commercial uses for, for some of them, and I was converting as much space as possible into residential space. Um, and 
uh, by doing something that others are not doing, um, you, you, you've got an open goal. And then when others catch up and realize what you've done, you find that the values, that you, values go up quite a lot, quite, quite a lot, quite exponentially. Um, and by that time, it's often too late. Um, I think what I've done in the past is, uh, oh, I've got, the, I've got the Baker Street coming up on, on Wednesday. Um, we're all going to be talking about opportunities post uh, COVID-19. I mean, I do run some courses on this and you can check out um, uh, details on this uh, on, my, on my website. Um, now, I, I think with, with, this, with this course, it's, it's, rather, it's rather unique. My next one is in May. Um, normally what I teach people is, um, in, in the past, I guess, I've, I've taught people uh, what I've done and it's in the rear view mirror, if you like. Um, what, what we have done is completely uh, changed our strategy for the COVID-19 opportunities going forward. Um, and for the first time ever, we'll be able to kind of take a group of people along and kind of give them, give them the information they need to do now uh, as we are doing it in our business. And I'm already seeing um, uh, the commercial property opportunities sort of, I mean, a lot of agents are furloughed. We've upped our direct to vendor marketing. We're getting a lot more responses from our direct to vendor marketing from commercial landlords looking to sell property. Um, and we're already seeing that vendors are adjusting their price expectations um, and getting a bit more realistic. Uh, so it should be some interesting times ahead. I think that's pretty much me really in a little potted tour of commercial property and how it's gonna change with, with COVID-19. Perfect, well that really was, you know, that was a fantastic presentation. The feedback from that was, was phenomenal. Um, I made the mistake of putting my, um, the Virgin giving page to my own emails and my phone froze, completely blew up um, by the number of emails coming through from the donations for your online workshops. That really was incredible. Um, we do have a few questions, but we're quite pushed for time at the moment. So what we're going to have to do is, essentially, anyone's got any questions, um, make sure you donate, get onto that um, exclusive access to the beta of the online online class because no doubt your questions will be answered on there yeah. through the content a, it, what it is it's a seven part video series that i'm doing um and um these folks will be the first people to uh get hold of that and all i want is some feedback really yeah absolutely um so yeah we're a little bit over now so what i'm gonna have to do is i'm gonna have to thank you very much Ranjan. that was really a really incredible um presentation i've learned a lot and i'm looking forward to getting onto the beta um i really enjoyed that um and i look forward to speaking with you soon thank you very much Brilliant. thank you thank you great job by the way perfect. good thing thank you cheers perfect